why we don't hear them read a lot in church. But violence is a very real part of so many people's lives. I think all of us are affected by violence of one type or another, some more than others. Experts say there's nine main forms of violence, physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, spiritual, cultural, verbal, financial, and neglect. Violence and abuse are used to establish and maintain power over another person. It is usually on equal power where the perpetrator uses the position they have, the gender they have, whatever they have, to dominate the other. The one thing to keep in mind is violence is a choice and it's preventable. And yet it's a part of all our lives. It's a part of every part of history. I watched more violent movies than I ever thought I would have 20 years ago. I have watched all the Avenger movies except Endgame, and don't spoil it for me. I've watched Stranger Things, and as I watch those with my children, I sometimes think, oh no, we're condoning this. But what I find in these Old Testament stories, and what I find in Avengers, what I find in Stranger Things, is the resiliency of people. Violence is real. People live through horrible, traumatic events, and yet somehow we rise. Somehow we learn empathy for others. Somehow we find a way to come together and say that is horrible, that is awful, it has hurt me deeply, and, and I choose life, I choose grace, and I choose compassion. We are changed by those horrible events, but sometimes it helps us to see the horror that other people are living through. It's not the way we want to get there, it's the way we learn sometimes in life. This story of Deborah is filled, filled with violence, but it's also we find that she rises above and through that. This is a horrible time in Israel's history. Some biblical scholars call it the dark ages of Israel. And we hear it, we heard it at the first lesson, and it's found six times throughout the book of Judges. The people quit following God and they only worried about themselves. The whole book ends, in those days Israel had no king, and everyone did as he saw fit. That's pretty much the book of Judges. So if you're having a really bad day and you want to think the world's going to hell in a handbag, this would be a good book to read. <laughs> it feels that way. But what we find is that everyone did their own thing. It was total narcissism. But think of the context. Judges happens right after Joshua has led the Israelites into the Promised Land. Joshua has died, and here are these people who took over the land from other people. They obliterated entire cultures. The land was theirs. They've been promised this land, and now they're trying to live. How do we live as these kind of people? And I think that privileged, that dominating mindset ruled their lives, and it came home. So people did not have a sense of community. People did not think of their neighbor. People only worried about themselves and the culture and the level of violence reflected that. It's into this setting that Deborah rises as a judge or a prophetess. We call her Judge Deborah throughout history. Judge in Hebrew is one who makes relationships right. Think about that. Her job was to make relationships right. So she held court. She held court under a palm tree. The palm tree was near these two smaller towns, and people came to her. They came to her with problems, and it didn't take them long to realize she had wisdom and she had integrity. And they listened to her, including army leaders like Barack. What she did was help people to see where their selfishness was affecting their relationships, where worrying only about themselves was causing rifts in their family, in their community, and in their nation. She helped them to see it, not by pointing a finger. As I said in the children's sermon, I've had plenty of people in my life say, you know what you need to do with this. I don't know about you, but that doesn't work with me. But when they help me to see that I'm a part of something bigger than myself, when they help me to understand that I have a role to play in this relationship, in this community, in this setting, everything changes. We're empowered by that. Now, we don't have any specific stories of Deborah. I wish we could have first-hand accounts of saying, you know what, I went to her with this problem, and here's what she said. We don't have that. <laughs> but we have wisdom stories from many cultures. There's 
one out of India where a wealthy merchant twice a year would travel to really remote villages. His goal was to find those arts and crafts that people did, especially he looked for silks and rugs. He was just going to leave, and this young man came in where he was eating and said, let me tell you, I have a deal for you. I'll go with you. I'll help carry everything. I'll, you'll be able to get even more if I'm along. He goes, because you're old and I'm young, you're frail and I'm strong, this is going to be a win-win. So the merchant agreed. They took off, and for a month they traveled. But every night as they ate supper, and he lavished him with wonderful suppers, the young man would excuse himself with the excuse he needed to relieve himself, but he would go back to their room and he would search for the man's money. That was his only intent, was to steal from this man. And he searched everywhere, under his pillow, under his mattress, in his bags, and he could not find anything. The second to the last night, he went and confessed. He said, I'm so sorry. He said, my only intent for coming with you was to steal from you. The wealthy merchant said, I knew that you were a thief the moment I met you. So he said, I stored, I hid the money where I knew you'd never look. It's under your pillow. <laughs> Deborah had that kind of wisdom. Instead of lecturing, instead of pointing fingers, she had this ability to help people to see and come forward in their own understanding of where they had strayed. Not having to say, you're a bad person. She helped them to see where they had erred. I invite you to think about the wise people in your life. Think about the wisest people you know. Those people, maybe a grandparent, maybe a neighbor, teacher, coach, parent, a person who you thought, this is a person I want to go back to. So. There are attributes of wise people. They first of all have had experiences in life, a lot of them. They learn from their experiences. They're tolerant, which I think means they listen. Instead of always having to have the last word, they listen. They are compassionate. They use their imagination. The number one thing I know about wise people is I want to spend as much time as possible with them. It's the people you want to be with, especially when you've hit rock bottom, especially when you're afraid, especially when you've messed up. You want to be with those wise people because instead of judging you, they guide you. Instead of lecturing you, they listen to you. And most of the time when you sit with them, they really don't give you that much advice, but they let you think it out then they guide you into the answer. Deborah was that kind of person. There's a story of a woman who was walking to a creek one day to get a drink of water. In the creek she found this precious gem. <coughs> so she added to her bag. And later that day she ran into a man who was homeless and hungry. And he asked her for some kind of offering. So she pulled out some bread and some water. And he saw that precious stone. And he said, can I have it? She said, sure, here it is. And she knew that it would probably supply him the rest of his life. A few days later, he sought out this woman and he said, I want to return this. I want something even more valuable. He said, what I would like is whatever you have that allows you just to hand that stone to me without any concern, without any fear. Wisdom is like that. The wise people in our life are like that. They're not trying to climb some corporate ladder. They're not trying to make things bigger and better. What they're trying to do is live authentic lives. What they're trying to do is help us to be authentic and establish right relationships once again if things have gone on right. Deborah led with this wisdom and this courage of people they live. I think one of the things to keep in mind is she didn't play small. She didn't play small at all with the gifts she had. I don't think the story of Deborah is about violence, although it's a huge part of the times in which she lived. I don't think the story is about Deborah getting credit or not getting credit. What if that's the good news of this story? Is that we're called not to play small. We're called to share our gifts wherever we are, even if it's the dark ages of Israel. Even if it's in tormented times that we're living through in our own life, in our city, in our country that we're called to share our gifts. Some of you know the saying by Marianne Williamson, our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate, our deepest fear that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You're a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. 
There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. They are, we are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not in just some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Deborah led and taught with this kind of wisdom. Martin Luther King Jr., when he was preaching his sermon, Loving Your Enemies, told the story of Abraham Lincoln that some of you are probably familiar with. When Abraham Lincoln was running as a Republican to become president, one of the Democratic opposition people went around the country bad mouthing him, making things up that weren't true. And of course, they didn't have a way to check that out with fact checking, um, with um, snoops and other things. So what this person did was just lambast him. He even picked on his looks. He said, you don't want a tall, lanky, ignorant man like this is the President of the United States. That person who backed off Lincoln was Edwin Stanton, a Democrat who supported the candidacy of John Breckinridge. As we all know, Abraham Lincoln was elected. And then the war broke out. And things did not go war for, well for the Secretary of War, or, um, excuse me, <coughs> Secretary of Defense. So they've lost two, so many battles, and what they found the problem was that he was inept and he was corrupt. So Lincoln sought to replace him. The person was Simon Cameron. So he sought to replace him, and he found the best candidate, and he announced to his advisors that he was going to hire or ask Edwin Stanton to be the Secretary of War. Lincoln's advisor said to him, are you a fool? Do you know what Edwin Stanton has to say about you? Do you know what he's done, tried to do, you, do, do to you? Do you know that he has tried to defeat you at every hand? Do you know these things, Mr. Lincoln? Did you read any of those derogatory statements that he made about you? Lincoln stood tall and said, oh yeah, I know about it. I've read about it, I've heard it myself. But after looking over the country, I find he's the best man for the job. Lincoln recognized that Stanton was intelligent, determined and patriotic, and he would give his full commitment to any challenge that was put in front of him. Obviously, we know the Union did much better after he took over. When Lincoln was dying, or when after he died, Stanton said one of the most brilliant things about him that has gone down in history. He said, now he belongs to the ages. After his death, he sought to bring John Wilkes Booth and his conspirators to justice. Leading requires courage and wisdom. And when we lead with courage and wisdom, it, it causes us to be humble and to trust other people. And those things do not come easy to most of us, humility and trust. Deborah is an example of that. So if you take anything away from all the graphic stuff we listened to this morning, please hear about courage. Please hear about not playing small. Please hear that we are given gifts in the setting we're in. Most of us don't pick our place in history, but God calls us forth in the history through which we live. Deborah's story ends. And Deborah returned to her palm tree between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. She covered her head and began again to judge the people. And the land had rest for 40 years. Amen. Let us pray. God of wisdom and courage, we give you thanks that you call us. And for all those days that we'd rather take it easy. For all those days, we'd rather avoid the hard things of life. We give you thanks that you give us courage. We ask that you be with us as we lead in our homes, in our congregations, in our communities, in our workplaces, and throughout the state. We ask that you give us courage and wisdom. We thank you for the gifts that you surround us with. We thank you for the gifts of this room that change lives, that remind us of your presence. We pray this in Jesus' holy name.